So Doug's going to lead us off. And um, and by the way, it's a very unscripted kind of thing. So yeah, we're sure. have, let's just have a conversation. I yeah. will answer Go for your it, questions. Doug. Whatever you All right. Doing. Let's rock and roll. Aloha, everyone. Welcome back to Talk Story Unscripted. I'm Doug. No, I'm Doug. You didn't think I was going to No. <laughs> I'm Pete, everybody. And today we are very honored to have a very special guest, filmmaker John Irwin. John, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for having me, for sure. Oh, absolutely. So, so John, you and your brother, you guys have had multiple very successful and very powerful films, including October Baby, Mom's Night Out, Woodlawn, I Can Only Imagine, and most recently, I Still Believe. What an incredible journey that you've been on for the past 10 years. Uh, and I'm curious, what has surprised you? What have been the surprises to you along this journey? That's a great question. It's a loaded question. I think thanks for, and, and thanks for the, the, the whole roster of movies. We've become the guys that did, I can only imagine in those other ones. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> the name of all. Certainly um, the biggest uh, surprise um, at, at the box office was I can only imagine. Um, and we're so grateful for uh, everyone's support of that film. It really did shock the industry. It was only supposed to open. Uh, I think all, all the trades sort of killed it before it opened. Like they tried to say it wasn't going to work and, and it, you know, it just didn't seem to, uh, they didn't understand it. And uh, mm -hmm. it's only supposed to about 4 million opening weekend and it did 17 and wow. uh, number, number three movie in America. It did end up, end up doing 85 million in box office and becoming the number one independent film of the year. And uh, we're so very grateful for, for just that whole journey um, yeah. uh, and for the support of the audience. And, you know, it was a song that I loved and a story that I didn't know. And, and uh, I think as a filmmaker and as a storyteller, you just have to, you know, believe that if something is meaningful and important uh, to you, that it, that it'll be meaningful and entertaining and important to other people. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we just want to tell stories that, that, uh, that are entertaining, that are emotionally relatable, no matter what you believe, but that really do, uplift and inspire people and draw people to what's true. And, um, right. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian and person of faith and I, and I just believe in, 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 in messages of hope that can be told to the world. And, and so, um, that's sort of why we do what we do and, and, and what we do. And, and, uh, and, you know, I would say if you talk about surprises though, I think, you know, what's interesting is that we did a, um, we did a film called uh, Woodlawn before we did a film called I Can Only Imagine. And, you know, they say every filmmaker finds their story and tells it over and over again. Um, I think we found our story with Woodlawn. We found the power of a, of an in, inspirational, true story as mm. a football story. Um, incredible story. First time we had uh, directed an Academy Award winning actor with John Voight. And, but we, we were heavily involved in the, in the fundraising for all of our films. Um, mm -hmm. That one being one, and it just did not accomplish what we hoped it would in the box office. And we didn't accomplish our goals and it was actually in a process of just embracing failure, really, mm -hmm. um, and studying it. We spent about five months studying, like soliciting criticism, asking questions, um, and asking uh, people, you know, what we what they think we did wrong, and, you know. And it ended up being a 170 page post mortem um, <laughs> sort of manifesto that that was the playbook for the success of I can only imagine. So, wow. the success of I can only imagine was actually born in a thorough study of, of, um, of something that was disappointing and, wow. and something that, that I think, uh, we went right at it. And so I think sometimes failure can be your, your greatest teacher. And, Absolutely. and while I love the product we created, I think, you know, my leadership needed to change. Um, you know, a lot of our processes needed to change. We, we, we saw insights into the market. You know, I, I did learn that, you know, if something's wrong with your organization and you're the leader, then something's really wrong with you. And, you know, go change yourself first because wow. it, it's rippling down into your organization. And, uh, and, and I think that we, we saw a lot of, we, we just, we saw around the corner a little bit just because we were willing to embrace yeah. and learn from disappointment. And so I think as artists, you know, art is a, and storytelling is a perpetual process of uh, discovery and mm. and uh and experimentation yeah so you're gonna lose you know and right. but actually failure is an essential part of the process oh. if you know how to fail well and uh sometimes uh, something that's disappointing can actually be sort of like a key that unlocks an incredible success and uh i think in retrospect that was actually surprising is that our biggest win was born out of one of our 
one of our more disappointing moments. I'm very proud of both of the films, right. but, but, uh, so I would just say, uh, uh, it's okay when you fail, as long as you learn from it. And, uh, as long, and sometimes the discoveries you make in that process are actually what right. your success. Well, and it's so crazy because a lot of people are afraid to even start from fear of that failure. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, just go into it knowing go you're going to fail and, go and knowing it. that good things are birthed from that failure. Yeah. yeah, I would say that I would say that failure is essential and you have to <laughs> you have to separate failure from the fear of failure. Mm. And then I think as an artist, you have to separate your identity from your work, you know, Ooh, so yeah. that you can see your your you can see the work objectively and you have to have a yeah. I think for a long time as an artist, I was trying to find an identity in my work and in my level of accomplishment. Well, mm -hmm. when people start to criticize and, you know, we work in an industry where there's an entire um, uh, category of, of job called critics. I mean, that's literally the name of the job. And so yeah. people are going to criticize you if you make movies. And uh, I remember Roger Ebert, before he died, uh, reviewed our first film. And for whatever reason, I remember what he said. He said, Rachel Hendricks is surprising in her first lead role. Jasmine Guy is sublime. And I'm sitting there reading a young filmmaker like, oh, Roger Ebert is like, he's going to like my movie. And then right after that line, he's like, I mean, unfortunately, the directing's terrible. The writing's terrible. <laughs> and he just ripped it to shreds. Like, you ruined my cheap dreams, Roger. Oh. But, uh, but you know, so you have to be able to sort of have an identity outside yeah. of the work and uh, not be sort of abusing your vocation for what it can yeah. do for you, which is to give you uh, an identity. And, and I think to, to some extent we did that and, and uh, learned. And I think it was through that study. Um, yeah, I just think, you know, it's like Thomas Edison said. He said, um, you know, I didn't fail. I just learned 10,000 ways not to make the light bulb. You know, wow. you got to try a lot of stuff to find what works. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. because a famous, I, I forget who said it, but a famous screenwriter said, you know, if we knew how to make hit films, that's all we'd make. You know, there, there's not Absolutely. a blueprint for this stuff. And, yeah. um, and so it's a process of discovering um, yeah. stuff through experimentation, which others would call failure. So you have to fail often and fail boldly. The biggest thing is you just can't fail the same way twice. You have to constantly mm -hmm. learn right. from, from, yeah. from the mistakes that you make. Uh, but, really if, but if you do that, you can win. Yeah, what were you saying about you? You know, identity being being connected to that film. I mean, let's let's face it. You know, being a creative and pouring your heart out into something, you are connected to it. That must be such a hard thing to be able to separate those two. Yeah, I mean, what's weird is you have to separate in some ways and not in others. Like, mm -hmm. I, I like what Christopher Nolan said. He said that that you know the audience, which we sit in service to the audience. Like, I don't even like the word director's cut in my business. It, whatever cut entertains and motivates the audience is what matters. You know, it's not yeah. about us. It's about the people sitting in the seats and the experience they're having with the film. Mm -hmm. And Nolan would say that the audience is smart enough to know whether or not um, a filmmaker is taking an emotional journey for themselves, like really vesting into the work or mm -hmm. simply using some bag of tricks to make uh -huh the audience feels something that they themselves don't feel. The audience knows that they feel yeah. that sort of dishonesty. So you yeah, have so to make true, a film man. for yourself. You have to make, yeah. it has to be intensely personal. Yeah. Um, and so it has to be sort of for you, but there's this point in the process for me, that point is, is the testing period where we begin to test the film with an audience and really begin to listen to an audience but there has to be a point in the process where you sort of divorce yourself from the work and say, this yeah. is now, it's no longer mine. I'm now giving oh. this and it, it belongs to the audience. It doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to the audience. So what are they having trouble with? And like, when you think about the film, I can only imagine, which was certainly our big success. Um, I had written it in a nonlinear fashion. So you started the story sort of out on the road with the band and you flash back and then you flash forward and all this stuff it absolutely worked on the page but and i love the first cut of the movie but when we screened it the audience just was not it was obvious the audience was not going with us on that journey mm -hmm. so instead of saying well this was my vision this was my intent i like it what's wrong with you we said, yeah. okay that's cool and we filmed like a days and a half worth of pickups and we stitched the whole film together into one linear it's just a simple linear powerful story and it scored like 40 points above average as soon as we did that. And so, wow. and became what it became. Uh, yeah. So I think that was a process of just listening to the audience. And I think you do have to divorce yourself uh, from the work at some point, uh, but you, you can't do it too early. Personal. Yeah. You can't do it too early because if you do it too early, 
then it's not, it lacks an honesty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you never do it, the thing never becomes, you become the barrier to what the work could become, if that makes wow. sense. And because it's all about you. Uh, this, this next question I have for you, there's a, a, a statement that you, both you and Andrew had learned early on, and I think you guys use this as your motto, and that's earn the right to be heard. And I yeah. love that, you know, and I, how does that work for you in filmmaking? And I, I think you've kind of answered that question, but. Well, you know, um, film is an interesting medium, if you think about it. Um, if you think about other forms of entertainment, um, music, sports, um, uh, theme parks, there is a, a, a differentiation in price based off the cost of what it took to create the experience. You know, you're going to pay mm -hmm. more to go to Disney World than you are to the county fair. You're, you're right. going to it's going to cost, you know, $400 a ticket to go see U2 than it's going to cost uh, to go see some independent rock band. Okay, in film, in the theatrical experience, it's the same price. It's the same price to go to Star Wars as mm -hmm. it is to go see my movie. And at the end of the day, filmmaking, the, it, I love it. It's an escape. It's, it's, a t it's a chance to escape the stresses and pressures of your life and have an experience that you could not otherwise have. And it's like a, it's like a, an oasis for people that are, you know, for just for, from our lives. And so to me, um, no matter what message I want to get through to the audience, because we are, we are, we do things that uplift and inspire the audience, make them better. We want to share things that we believe are true. We, we, we really latched on to this. I remember talking to Bart Millard who wrote, I can only imagine and say, what, what is the emotional experience of the song? I'm trying to understand it. I mean, I know what it is for me. And he said, it's a rush of hope, you know, and we really do want to bring that to audiences through the films that we make. But we say we must first entertain. Mm. The business is entertainment, right? The business right. is not ideology. Mm. And people are trusting us with their time and with their money. The mm. same amount of money that it would take to go see Jurassic World or Star Wars, same amount of time, the popcorn's the same price. Um, and so I want to entertain them first and foremost, and I want to give them what I want out of movies, which is a powerful emotional experience. That's yeah. why I go to the movies and we first want to give them that. And so what we say, because we do care about the message of the film is that we should never use the message as a crutch for a, for a poor product. We should earn the right, uh, for our message, not use it as a crutch for, for something that should not otherwise exist. So we want to win. We want to win in our genre. If we're doing, a movie like I still believe that's a sort of a romance. We, we, we want the audience to feel all those things. If we're doing a film, like I can only imagine, uh, you know, we want the audience to feel this uplifting rush of hope, you know? And, and, uh, and so we really try to, um, what we call it, we call it the relentless pursuit of perfection. Like knowing we'll never get there. I, I, I know I can't watch my films uh, after they, after I can't change them. The moment I can no longer change the film, I can no longer watch it for years. Uh. Um, and I remember I finally, my daughter is 11 now, but I remember she, when she was like, uh, probably five or six, probably five. Um, I, the first thing I had ever directed that was long form was a documentary, um, called the cross in the towers, which was about the people that worked the work ground zero and, uh, their stories and the crap, the cross that they found buried in the rubble. Wow. Um, and, and how that became a symbol of hope and was actually the only monument at ground zero for five years. And, uh, and but I hadn't watched it. It comes on TV every year. So, I, so my daughter's very young. I had to, I watched it. So I finally was like, I'm going to watch this thing. And, um, and I'm watching it and I'm like, it's full of mistakes, but it's not terrible. It's, 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 you know, I'm like, it, I, I, I'm, I'm, I kind of like it. And, uh, wow. my daughter comes in and she sits down on the couch and she says, daddy, can I watch a cartoon? I'm like, no, I, I made that. See that, that, that's why, how we live here. <laughs> I made that. And she looks at it for like 30 seconds and she's like, daddy, it's not very good. And she walks off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so uh, you know, I think that, that I have trouble because I'm such a perfectionist and I only see like yeah. the things that I would have done differently. Right. But there is a relentless pursuit of improvement and mm. of getting as close to perfect as we can, knowing we'll never get there. I mean, claiming the words of George Lucas, who said film, uh, films are never complete. They're only abandoned. And that's true. You know, they're finally just like, <laughs> oh, no, I want to, you know, but, but, yeah. um, but I think that we should try. And, right. uh, and I, I love that line in one of the best movies last year, in my opinion, Ford versus Ferrari, uh, oh, yeah. where, you know, he's explaining the, the, the quest for the perfect lap, you know, mm. and then his son says, but it's, it, 
a perfect lap, it's impossible. You can't do it. And he says, I'm almost tearing up, but I can try. Mm-hmm. I think we should, we should apply that level, especially I've just seen the things that makes me crazy is people that want to do what I would call ideologically based uh, entertainment. Um, for me, I'm a, I'm a person of faith, Christian, and that, that is what influences my films a, in terms of messaging, but whether, whatever it is, um, whether it's the environment, social justice, you know, if you want to put a message in your film, there is this category of thought where it's like, well, the film doesn't really have to deliver because of its message mm. uh, as long as that's in there. I, that makes me crazy. I mean, in my yeah. opinion, it's like the film should deliver more because of its message and we should work right. harder to yeah. entertain because of the message that we care about because we right. think it's more than entertainment. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, we, and we chase that relentlessly as an organization to the point where, you know, we say it, it's pretty excruciating to try to make a, a truly great film. Mm. But it's also pretty hard to make something mediocre that you don't even want to associate yourself with. <laughs> Use the pseudonym like, for that one. I don't want to be a part of that. You know, it's like seventy percent right of the work to do that. So why not go above and beyond right. to really to really try to accomplish something great? And uh, and so that that's what we that's what we seek to do. And we know we'll never get there. And the films will always be full of mistakes. But constant measured improvement is is sort of what we chase. That's that's great. so good. And it's it's so cool to see where you are at now, you and your brother, uh, after all of those years of, of, of chasing perfection and, and failures and, 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 you know, learning from those failures. But as I was, I got to tell you, John, I was so inspired when I heard how things kind of set off for you, you working on the set of courageous before yeah. you were making your own films and Alex Kendrick, who I respect uh, very much telling you that it was time for you to get off the sidelines and start, te- and start telling your own stories. Yeah. What was it like to have Alex Kendrick basically commission you yeah. into filmmaking? Yeah, you know, sometimes questions can be the most powerful thing. And, uh, <laughs> and Alex is sort of a guy that right after he meets you, he gets up all in your face and, and uh, asks you really powerful questions. And at the mm-hmm. time, I was a music video and commercial director. My brother and I had started our careers for working for ESPN. I started working for ESPN when I was 15 because a cameraman got sick and I basically lied about my age to to work (laughs) for ESPN. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling anyone young listening to this program to do that. Don't try this at home. Don't try. I'm not saying I did the right thing. I'm just telling you what happened. Um, And and my dad helped us uh, get some, my dad helped us get a loan for $10,000 the next year to get some gear. I was 16. Also not telling people to don't go, you know, get a loan for $10,000 when you're 16 years old. No, but, uh, and we started making stuff and working for ESPN and making stuff during the week. And just um, what Malcolm Gladwell would call that 10,000 hour rule in a book called Outliers that you just have to put in the time refining your craft for a long period of time, you know, and uh, a lot of people don't respect that part of the process. Uh, yeah. So we did that. And then uh, the music artists, um, Michael B. Smith and Amy Grant and some others gave us a break to do music videos for them. I still don't understand why. And, and we sort of <laughs> uh, made a name for ourselves doing music videos and, um, and also sort of high-end uh, commercials. And that was just, it, w- there was no career plan. Like we, we talked about how it was almost like, you know, Harrison Ford and in Indiana Jones. It was, it was like, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. That was sort of the, the, the career up to that point. And I, I started working, I worked for Alex Kendrick on the movie courageous because as you know, total Cinderella story. Uh, yet at that time they're making movies out of Sherwood church right. and, uh, uh, pastor Michael cat, who I dearly love. And, and, um, and so there was like a thousand church volunteers involved. Well, they wanted to do courageous and they want to do some action scenes, a lot of action scenes involving cars. Well, the, the, you should ne- these are two great things, but you should never combine that with a thousand church volunteers. Like people will you know, get run over and die. So I liked doing action. I, I liked chasing things and blowing things up with, with cameras, you know, and we, we in fact, we had done that year. We had done a, a, a couple of music videos for this band, uh, skillet, a great, people and at the time we used to like have to write these long music video treatments like five pages of what we thought and what we would do and you know a lot of words like awesome and beautiful and amazing you know and but we had gotten popular so I remember I had written a treatment for this song hero for skillet that just said basically the band is singing at night things start to blow up then it starts to rain, then it rains and things blow up, then everything blows up the end. And, and, <laughs> and they're like, this is great. So I, I like doing that. Uh, yeah. 
that type of work. And, and so I, I went in to work with and for the Kendricks just to understand uh, Alex's vision, Stephen's vision, what they wanted to accomplish. And then I would take teams of professionals to do the, the action work in the film. So nobody died. And uh, the first question that Alex asked me uh, was, uh, John, what's the purpose? Like we, 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 we watch you, like we look at you, you know, we've, we've watched some stuff that you've done and we sort of just trying to understand like, what's your purpose and the purpose of your work? And mm. that was such a great question because I couldn't answer it. I didn't know the answer. To, I didn't know what the answer was. I didn't know, uh, but also I couldn't stop thinking about it. And that was a moment where sort of my um, career met my calling. And I would just mm. say, that's a great question for anyone to ask. You don't have to answer it immediately, but why do you do what you do? Right. Um, what, what is the purpose that drives you? What's a purpose beyond yourself that drives you? And think about that question. And what I realized was that God had given us a gift and, and he had also given us the gift of time to refine that gift through mm. all these videos that we had made. And it was now time to use that gift for a reason beyond ourselves and to, um, to, to promote a, a, you know, a life changing message of hope to the world. And so that's when we got in the game with a movie called uh, October baby, which the first quarter million dollars I raised for that was from my grandmother. Who <laughs> I kept getting to remind that she had invested in it and she did very well, by the way, but um, a lot of the stuff I'm telling you, you should not do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, at any rate uh, it was sort of like the Mike Tyson quote when he said, all boxers have a plan until they get in the ring and get punched in the face, you know, right. they, it was just learning as you, as you go and God um, really blessed it and, and, and blessed us and um, the film cracked the top 10. And then it was just about, you know, um, just learning and growing and learning and growing and That's just right. being resilient. You know, I, I think the big reason why so many people fail is because they just quit too soon. Like if you think mm -hmm. about it, my dad said when I, when he bought us the camera when I was 16, Hey guys, if you give 20 years of your life to something, you'll really master it. Well, it was 20 years, almost like to the month between that statement and the success of I can only imagine. Right. Wow. So imagine if I had given up, cause again, I said Woodlawn was a big disappointment for us and, and we learned from it. Imagine if we had given up at year 19, mm -hmm. like a lot of times success is like when you're driving your car through fog, you know? Yeah. And it, it seems like it just goes on forever. And then like that, it clears, you know, and it's yeah. gone. Success is like that. Oh, yeah. And you never know when that moment is. And so, yeah. so many people just quit in the fog yeah. when the fog could have break, could break 10 feet from you, you know? Yeah. And, and imagine if we had given up at year 19 and a half, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. or, or, or year 18 or year 15. Sometimes I think success belongs to people that just keep going. And, and, uh, you know, as Churchill would say, go from failure to failure with great enthusiasm, you know, until yeah. they catch their break. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, if God calls you to something, one of the keys is just to not give up, just to keep learning yeah. and keep growing and just to that's never right. quit, you know? And oh. I think for us, that's, that's, that's what happened. But certainly Alex asking me that question was a huge turning point in, uh, uh, in our career. That's oh. great. Well, you know, just, just so you know, when I saw Woodlawn not long ago, but I remember I was actually living in Australia and that's when I first heard about Woodlawn and everything you were doing, you know, your, your fundraising and whatnot. And I was like, oh, this, this sounds great, but I couldn't find it living in Australia. I couldn't really see yeah. it. And I finally watched it. Oh, maybe a couple of months ago or so. And I absolutely loved it. Just so you I'm know. I'm glad so, you liked the movie. Uh, you. Yeah, I thought it was a great movie. And actually, my wife and I both agreed that's probably one of the best Christian films. Or I, I hate to call it a Christian film, but, you know, a film with, well, with you Christian know, aspects I, I'm, in it. I'm, uh, I, I like, you know, being, it's so very rare to be able to be a part of a group of pioneers that shape something. That's um, right. Towards what it can become. And to me, as a Christian, the message, the transforming message of hope, that never changes, right? Yeah. But the methods of getting it to people, the, the, the method, you know, the, the, the mechanisms, they do change over time. Absolutely. And so there's this constant, I love this verse in Acts that says, David served the purposes of God in his generation. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that he served the purposes of God in a unique way, in a unique time. And yeah. to me, we have to own our time. And we have to own our generation. And so I think as right. you look at mass entertainment, uh, a, a theatrical motion picture 
is one of the best ways to communicate that's ever invented. It's a story way to communicate. Jesus told stories like we should that's be right. so good at this. We should not be behind in this. Yeah. I don't know what happened. We weren't always behind in the arts. I mean, go, my goodness, go take the tour of, 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 of churches throughout Europe and you realize that Absolutely. The, the merging yeah. of faith and art used to be uh, first class. Wow. Um, we're in this blip where it's not. And, uh, and so I think that the way out of that is to work together and to climb on each other's shoulders and to really think about mentoring and empowering the next generation of talent. So I remember one time I was talking to Sean Astin and he said, uh, I see you guys as frontiersmen and pioneers. And he was talking about Andy and I, Alex and Steven, Devon Franklin, um, you know, just some of the early pioneers of faith film. And, uh, I said, thanks, Sean. That's high praise. And he said, you know, John, most frontiersmen end up dying on the frontier and then the settlers <laughs> yeah. come in and they, they name things after them, but they, they're dead. On the, I'm like, well, the, the trail will be clearly marked. I'll be <laughs> yeah. close and pointing to the summit. But the yeah. point is that, that I think, and I have absolute faith, that there is enormous talent yeah. uh, behind Andy and I and others. And it is our job to pave the way for them and to give them a platform. And I love wow. it that Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant were two of the music artists that gave us our break because they did that in music. There were some mm -hmm. early artists, there were some early pioneers in Christian music. And, and there's this incredible and incredibly diverse platform of, of what can happen. So it's no longer just one type of music. You have um, you know, gospel and CCM and hip hop and, and, and everything in between. Um, but all that serves the same purpose of, of, of getting this message of hope to the world. And so I hope I, I have great confidence that the same thing can happen in film and that we will play a role. And I, I don't know, I don't know how far we'll be able to go, but, but I know that I've never sensed this sort of opportunity in Hollywood for Christianity and for yeah. sort of a rebirth of Christianity in Hollywood. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I agree with it's you. Very, it's really exciting. I remember when we did the deal at Lionsgate after I can only imagine, I love that studio. I love its leadership. I'm learning so much. But I was meeting with CEO, uh, John Fellheimer, and came out of his office, and there was the heads of one of the other divisions that was sort of in the corner. And he sort of waved me over. He's like, come here, come here, come here. Okay? And he's like, I just want you to know, I'm a Christian, and I'm here, and there's a few of us. You know? And he's like, wow. <laughs> and, and we're here, and we're so glad you're here. Wow. Okay, I and I literally was able to tell him, like, I think, look, they're paying me a lot of money to be here. I came in the front door of this building. Uh, that's they so like cool. us. I'm like, this is the moment you don't have to whisper anymore. You can, <laughs> yeah. you can tell people that you, that, you know, that you're a Christian and that's happening all over the industry. And, and I just think wow. the world might, uh, at least in my lifetime, there's never been a hunger for hope. And, uh, and ours is a message of hope. I mean, we have to remember that the gospel literally means good news. That's the meaning of the yeah. word. And, right. Uh, right. and I think that, that we can, um, I think it just takes a relentless drive and a relentless spirit. It does come mm. at a cost, um, mm. but sort of like Caleb in the Bible who said to Joshua, give me this mountain, you know? Yeah. Right. And uh, we have to have, we have to apply that line of thought to the, the hill with the Hollywood sign on it. Like, let's take it, you know? And, uh, and then, and then see if, what if happens. God's in it, it'll win. You know? Yeah, and, that's, and so, excellent. that's God, excellent. God, God is doing so much work in the entertainment industry. And yeah. uh, I think we're only at the beginning of what's, what, 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 what all of this can become. Wow. That's so exciting. Hey, well, we're running out of time already. I can't believe this, but we'll keep going as long as we can. But um, I have to get personal with you, John. Sure. You know, it's a really interesting story here. I saw I Still Believe, the story with Jeremy Camp. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, you feature a band called The Cry. And believe it or not, I actually managed The Cry for a period. Are you serious? I'm serious. And I was John Luke's, uh, uh, we were roommates. That's so it incredible. Really yeah, it was so fun to watch the movie and weird, you know, like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I could watch this. And John, <laughs> he doesn't look like Jean Luc, you know, of course yeah, I was yeah. getting critical. But, yeah. and I knew, of course, you couldn't have the same looking guy in there. But sure. what was really fun is there is a scene, it's a pivotal scene in the movie where John Luke and, and Jeremy are having a conversation in a car. And mm -hmm. John Luke says this he says, it's not who you can live with, it's who you can't live without. Yeah. And what was so funny is that's the scene that I had with Jean-Luc as I had to tell them I was no longer managing them. I was oh, moving yeah? to Australia. How about and that? And he says, how are you leaving? I go, you know what? I can't live without this girl. And she was Australian. So I moved back. How about that? And, and it's just so weird. So I got to ask you, how did that scene come about? Well, you know, the, uh, in film, when you do, we do a lot of adaptations of true stories. So, so like um, I'm working on this film on, on the, um, on the Super Bowl MVP Kurt Warner, and uh, 
and also on a film called Jesus Revolution. And so that'll be like the sixth true story that we've adapted in a row. And, and so I, that's sort of a, I like adapting true stories. I think there's a power in true stories. And you have to make concessions. So you have to compress events and composite yeah. characters. So John Luke in the film, I still believe is actually a composite of two people that were both mentors to Jeremy. And that's where you get the love triangle aspect of it, which did not involve John Luke, but- oh, um, Sorry guys. Did, uh, Oh, is that our clock? Oh my gosh, yeah, no, don't worry. Diffuse it now, it's going to explode. <laughs> gosh. Um, <laughs> cut the red up wire. Back up, yeah, back cut up, up bit, man. Uh, yeah. oh we just got one of the wires, I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, uh, so, so yeah, so uh, Jean-Luc in the movie um, was a composite of two characters, both of which were mentors um, to, to Jeremy. Uh, but the, that's where the love triangle in the movie comes from. That was not with Jean-Luc, the artist, that was actually with, uh, Jeremy's other mentor, sort of his, um, and that was a, a Bible study leader. So we had to put those two characters together. But Jean Luc was an incredible mentor in Jeremy's life. And so as we wrote the movie, we sort of made him, beyond the, the complexity of this love triangle, be sort of a real mentor to Jeremy. And I love the Cries music. I remember I was like, we have to cover the Take My Hand and Walk song. Cause I remember I used yeah. to listen to that as like a teenager, <laughs> you know? I love yeah. that song. I used to sing it, you know, like, like in the car, like an idiot in the top of my lungs. And uh, <laughs> so, so we, I, we really wanted to cover that song and, uh, and sort of work in the history of that band. And, and again, how sort of one artist influenced the other and how one artist helps the other. And, and yeah. John Luke was very helpful. Tim and along the process, he's a great guy, and uh, and I was I was honored to to sort of portray him, and I love the sort of the world of Christian music that the movie orbits yeah. in, and how interesting that is, and uh, it's really cool. So so uh, at any rate, uh, that's sort of how that came about. It's cool. It's that's it's great. a small world, man. It's but a it's very a great small world. Yeah. It's some great music. I love how one artist inspires the other, and yeah. how everyone just sort of builds on each other's shoulders. And that, like I say, that's what we're trying to do in film as well. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's so awesome. good. You know, I, I wish that we could stay with you longer, John. This has been so good. You, you've shared some powerful wisdom, and I really appreciate yeah. what you've shared. Uh, and we are looking forward to the work that you're going to be doing on, on the film about the Jesus Revolution. That's a huge thing for Pete. I know he was a, a, a part of it. He was there. Oh, I'll well, we'll talk to you then. I was yeah. a young kid. I was this, you know, I was probably 18, and everybody else was in their middle 20s. Yeah. Yeah, I remember discovering, you know, if you think about, uh, the, the cover of Time Magazine uh, in 1967, one of the covers, first time there was not a picture on the cover, was just the, the question, is God dead? Yeah. Four years later, Jesus is on the cover of Time. Yeah. And it says the Jesus Revolution. And so I got obsessed with, as we did the, the movie Woodlawn, which was one story nested in this time. Yeah. A time so similar to what we're going through now. Mm. I totally simple. agree with you. Like yeah. If you study the year 1968 and you study what it's like right now, it's just all so resonant, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it right in the middle of that time, uh, in a, in a time of, of despair, honestly, and a time when a generation really looked to, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll for meaning and for purpose. And it didn't really yeah. work out like they had hoped, especially yeah. like with LSD. Um, they turned to God and out of that came this incredible, uh, uh, what I would call the, the greatest revival in the last 50 years. Yeah. We've had several of them all the way back right. to the beginning of our country. And so it's just, it's a fun story. It's a hysterical story. It's, it's incredible. It's the story of sort of the origins of that movement um, uh, in Southern California. It's meaningful. You'll laugh, you'll cry. It's a great story. John Gunn's directing it, who directed Case for Christ and also like Dandelion Dust. And we've been, I've been producing and co-writing it. And it's been a passion of mine for five years and, and I can't wait for people to see it. We were actually six weeks away from starting to shoot it uh, before when COVID shut down the world. So, so yeah. we're, we're waiting to get back up uh, and running. But um, it's incredible that a movie like that can be made right. uh, by a major studio. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, back in the title is incredible. Yeah. And, uh, and I just believe that there can be another Jesus revolution in our time and, uh, and in this generation. And uh, right. I think it is time. And so, yes. you know, the, the best thing that we can do as storytellers is tell you the story of the last one. Right. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very excited about that and, and the films great. that we can make. And, and, bef yeah. and before we let you go, John, uh, are you planning on ma making any movies in Hawaii? Are you I was about to say, why is this not an in-person interview? Like, I don't, <laughs> I, I'm not good with this at all. I mean, this, this needs, well, we need to, this, the uh, highest right. level of quality we can achieve is if we were in person. Yeah. I just think That's right. next time. And I think it would take several days. I think we need to do an interview that would last 
Come on the beach. Days. On the beach. Right on the, on the beach. Yeah. That I can well, write off. And, here's uh, something, John. Work, John, we've you know, got so a proposal for you. You know, first of all, we we want to do a film festival here, so we'd love for you to come talk a bit about film. Hey, let's do this, right? We've got a beautiful location. It's on the screen right now, and and that's one. Number two, we already talked Alex into coming here and making a film. So we need an action guy. We need a second AD, right? We Done. need a second director. I'll we do his a, action sequences. You know, I'll do those foot yeah. chases on the beach that go real That's far. That's right. Uh, yeah. I, I think. Baywatch, uh, right? I, I mean, think. <laughs> I think one of those things. I remember directing the second movie I did, Mom's Night Out. We did for Sony, and um, fun movie, by the way. I, I made it for my wife, and and uh, just as sort of a love letter, and uh, it was so much fun to to make, and and uh, and comedy is so difficult, by the way. It's by far the most difficult genre, but. It's called Mom's Night Out. So the idea is it's a night of chaos that ensues with this one group of moms over the course of one night. So as a filmmaker, we're filming overnight, every night oh. for four weeks, which means you start working at 7 p.m. And it was in Alabama and it was hot. And I literally had this thought of like, why did I not name this movie Mom's Day in Hawaii? <laughs> what are we doing? Why are we That's out it. here? It's hot. It's at I night. Love it. We're all bleary eyed because we've been doing overnights for three and a half weeks. And so, you know, maybe I'll fix that mistake eventually. Deal. That's right. And, uh, That's right. Just, yeah. Know, I think, uh, you know, I'm excited that we've had John here. I think he's the Michael Bay of Christian movies, right? <laughs> sure. Sure. Why not? Please come up with a better story, though. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. That's and, an uh, example of that. You got to believe in your work. When you don't believe yeah. in your work, so, the audience knows. When you watch some of, some of, yeah, I won't get, yeah, I would. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, it's true. Like, oh, let's go see a Michael Bay movie. There won't really be a story, but we'll see things blown up. I love It'll it. It'll be fun to <laughs> yeah. see things. Yeah. Anyway. I did finally watch Transformers, the last one, whatever that was, whatever yes. number that And I was just like, wow, I can't even follow this. Like, oh, yeah. No. And then, like, Six Underground, I think, was it, was that his? Was that the one, Netflix? the Netflix one? I yeah. was just like, did they just say, we don't need a story? No, they just went for it. <laughs> Why do we need that? Nobody watches the whole thing on Netflix anyway. Yeah. They just watch the action scenes. Let's just put those it's together. So bad. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, it was crazy. Can we get a car flying <laughs> out of a out. you know twenty? Yeah, that's, 20 that's all now. people care about anyway. Storytelling. Very true. Very true. This is the point of that. Hey, you guys. Uh, this John. This has been such an honor to have you on the show. Thank you yeah, so man. much for your time and for your wisdom you shared. And for those of you who want to learn more about John Irwin and the films that he's a part of, the link is on the screen. Make sure you check it out. Some amazing films they've been a part of. Yeah. God bless you, John, everything that you're doing. Oh, thanks for having me. And look, the most important thing is if God's calling you to something, um, uh, keep dreaming, keep believing, and just never give up, no matter how uh, no matter how, how hard it gets. Eventually, the fog will clear if you just keep going. God bless you guys. Thanks for having God me on. God bless you, too. We'll see you next Thank time on Talk so Story Unscripted. Okay, take yeah. care. Yeah, God bless.